So I'm particularly focused on, again, this issue of global equity between vaccines, demand and supply. And I'm using uh, two case examples as well. I will contrast Gavi and its operating model and how it works to accelerate access, um, equitable access um, to ex existing vaccines and contrast that with the COVAX experience and how partners work together to try to address the COVID-19 situation. Um, I believe that you know, many of you are familiar with the details around Gavi and how it works, but just I'll spend a little bit of time uh, recounting. It has been in, I think it's its 20 year, 20, 20 year anniversary last year. Um, it's been operating um, and you'll see from some of the pictures, learned a lot along the way and really accelerated both the volume of uh, vaccines that has distributed to the poorest children globally, but also really helped accelerate the introduction of and manufacturing of new vaccines as they become available. What won't be captured here, but I think is really an exciting component of what Gavi has done is it's actively delay or um, shortens the delay time between when a vaccine is made available in high income countries and when it's made available um, to low income countries. And you'll see the COVID experience was that, that on steroids, even though Unfortunately, even then, there was still enough of a gap that it really made a difference. So Gavi is a, an alliance. Um, I'll refer to it as Gavi, but it's a composition of a set of partners, WHO, UNICEF, manufacturers, importantly, countries, also donors, and this constellation of partners work together um, to advance its core mission, which has equity very much at the center of the work it does in an effort to save lives and protect people's health. It's focused explicitly on equitable and also sustainable use and access to vaccines. And I think the sustainability really comes from an acute uh, and intense intentional focus on the affordability, but also the sustained availability of those vaccines. When it was first started in 2000, so I guess that's 23 years, um, it had a set of 78 eligible countries. Um, since then, I think it's now down to 54 um, with a number of countries having transitioned, um, which means they've shifted to a situation where they're supporting and self-financing their own programs, which I would say is a success in and of itself because it's really demonstrated not all due to Gavi. Clearly, countries have had economic success and development, um, but the fact that a key component of that development has been vaccine programs, I think, is a really big, um, important um, outcome uh, of the Gavi work. So um, the Gavi model, very specifically, so how does it operate to try to ensure that there's sufficient supply, it's affordable, it's appropriate, and it's sustainable? And this is a, um, you know, a very high level sketch of some of the key components of that model. Um, but at its heart are two things. One of them is the pooling of demand and the impact that that has on an ability of the, of the alliance to negotiate and uh, tender for good pricing of the vaccines that they're looking for. Um, but it also helps ensure that we have information about what countries are interested in and there's a real active engagement of the um, in, in implementing countries right from the beginning. Uh, it's driven uh, from the country. So what vaccines are available in the portfolio and what vaccines are available at the country level comes down to a country decision. And so there's an active partnership a lot um, executed and implemented by WHO um, and UNICEF on the ground with other partners to build out an understanding of what are these programs, what are the priorities, and then those translate into requests to the Secretariat for support for, for vaccines of those particular um, uh, antigens. So the pooling um, and then what follows, the market shaping work that it's able to do, again, has a great impact on the affordability of those vaccines. So market shaping in a nutshell is the opportunity to tender and provide visibility that there's going to be demand over a certain time period, that there's funding behind that. And those are important signals that go to the manufacturers of vaccines um, for them to consider, OK, this is a viable market. This is a place where we can either make production decisions that will involve expanding volume in order to meet this opportunity, it could pull in additional suppliers, um, again, with an effort to create a more sustainable 
a healthy market, if you will, um, for different different diseases. And you know, by bringing in new suppliers, you also create more competition that in turn allows for lower pricing or more competitive pricing. And so the dynamic of being able to channel and signal the fact that demand and the nature of that demand in a transparent way, um, and in turn having funding to back that up and that negotiation has really ended up resulting in a, a, you know, a rapid change in the way vaccines are priced and introduced in low-income countries. You can see a dramatic increase over time in the number of vaccines that have been available, made available through Gavi over the years. Um, the most recent ones are the introduction of malaria into the program, as well as COVID-19, um, and then Ebola and, and backing up um, from there. Again, given that demand of countries really helps drive, as does the availability of funding, what ends up in the portfolio, it is not a foregone conclusion that the availability or the existence of a vaccine necessarily means that that vaccine is made available through uh, Gavi. So, and and the portfolio is continually reviewed um, every five years. There's a relook at the vac vaccine investment strategy and reconsiders as new vaccines are coming on the market, um, but also vaccines that aren't yet in the portfolio to really consider whether the cost benefit of introducing those um, really lends itself to a use of funding for Gavi. An example potentially right now is dengue vaccine, where there is a dengue vaccine on the market. It's primarily considered a vaccine of importance in middle-income countries, um, but both because outbreaks are becoming more prominent, et cetera, but, but also because you know, the, the, the um, anticipation of that dengue becoming potentially more important is fueling, I think, a really important conversation around should we add dengue, um, et cetera. So this is the growth of the portfolio over time. And, you know, alongside the availability of those vaccines is very much the support of countries of their health systems. And you know, if you go all the way back to the point around what are countries looking to introduce, what do their programs look like? Gavi has always been right from the beginning in the business of both making available uh, for very low prices. Majority of countries are still paying a relatively low, a few five cents originally used to be 20, it's now 25, I think, per uh, dose, very low co-payment. So they have some skin in the game, but a relatively small amount. But alongside that, and again, it varies a lot by country and what's needed and what's being asked, but there's also a very um, advanced health system strengthening component to the work that Gavi does in country. And we'll see in the instance um, when we get to the COVID example, that actually the fact that certain countries had been actively working on building out their health systems to support routine immunization has turned into a real asset when they had to pivot and start to try to build a response to, to COVID-19. But I, you know, I think what's also important here is early and still disproportionately now, children are the primary infants, you know, routine immunization, the well-established programs are the primary programs supported by Gavi. But as the portfolio of available vaccines differentiates and we end up having new vaccines, HPV probably being a great example where the cost benefit of HPV is kind of greater than I think almost any of the other vaccines in the portfolio, but it involves targeting a totally different population than the existing routine immunization systems are designed for. And as much as HPV has actually been a, a work in progress for Gavi over almost 10 years, a lot to do with the fact that countries just didn't have established mechanisms for reaching teenage girls. Um, and so what is those, what's those systems that need to be in place in order to support and enable a vaccine program for that? COVID, again, everything happened very, very quickly, but there too, as you know, the target population of priority, especially after the first year, and as it became more clear who was you know, disproportionately at risk, is adults, people over 65, people with comorbidities. And again, all of these populations tend not to be certainly the targets of recipients for, for routine vaccines. They may be you know, in the system for other health um, issues, HIV and so on, but as far as being able to build on your existing immunization system, there was a lot of challenge in doing that um, for the COVID case. 
in summary, for Gavi in particular, you know, again, focused on reaching children, you know, a huge impact over the last 20, 25 years, um, you know, the number of lives saved, and also this key issue around um, economic benefit, which is not only the cost saved by not having to treat and deal with people who are sick, but it's also very much the opportunity those that aren't taking care of their sick children or aren't themselves sick have to contribute to the economy. And so a, a huge driver and benefit of vaccines as is well known, um, you know, links to, to that economic benefit. And this is an estimate of the impact from, from Gavi's investments. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the sustainability piece is also really critical. Ultimately, you know, Gavi theoretically would like to be out of a job at some point because countries have been able to move to a place um, where they're no longer dependent on support. But in any case, there's been a number of countries that have started to transition um, and, and continue to work with and can Gavi but receive, receive uh, a, lot a lot less direct, direct funding, funding support, support um, and are involved again in a different way. So that is the specific Gavi model. It's been fine tuned over you know, two decades um, and operates primarily with vaccines that are already been approved. And so, um, you know, it has, and, and back to Sylvie's comment around flu, there are existing manufacturers, you might get in the business of trying to encourage other manufacturers to come in. And a lot of that's driven by, again, visibility and predictability of, of the size of the market. Um, but it's, uh, there's a lot of knowns. And at the time that COVID-19 uh, and the pandemic broke, and Gavi sitting with it, this alliance and also partnerships that had it established, for example, with Ebola and other things, you know, recognizing it had a lot to contribute. But a real question was what was the model and what could we learn from what Gavi's day job looks like? What, what could we apply and what, what would be relevant um, for COVID-19? So specifically, um, and Sylvie's already presided some visuals on the COVAX um, structure Again, it was set up um, as one of the pillars for Act A. It was a vaccine pillar. The key um, or anchor partners uh, were something called CEPI, which focuses specifically on R&D for vaccines for um, epidemics and pandemic um, infectious diseases, UNICEF, WHO, um, and Gavi. And it was that set of four uh, organizations that cover from early R&D all the way through to in-country delivery pulled together to try to figure out how do we, as a, a set of organizations, organize to avoid, and this is, I think, the critical piece, how do you avoid not replicating what's happened in every other outbreak, which is, again, where Sylvie started, is that gap, so that delay. And, you know, the intent and all the decisions that we were taking very rapidly in real time and design changes that we were trying to make were really with the aspiration to try to minimize that gap as best as possible. Um, and so I'll go through some of the details there, but again, that that equitable, and I really like the picture of, of the boxes, but um, it struggled there too. I mean, in this case, it was not only that everyone would have vaccines, but in fact, the time made so much a difference, especially early on when, again, it wasn't clear whether what role vaccines might play in, in bringing the pandemic to an end, um, the importance that not, not just from a political standpoint, but just an actual public health perspective, you needed everyone to be getting vaccines as quickly as possible. So, you know, the key components of COVAX in a very simple fashion, you know, we you see reference to an AMC, and AMC was this fund that was established. Um, it, you know, it was the driving engine for procuring vaccines essentially for COVAX. Um, it ended up building a portfolio. It took at risk purchase commitment. So, um, advanced um, purchase agreements established with companies at risk before we knew whether those vaccines would work. Again, very different from what Gavi normally does, but taking bets and risks um, in an effort, again, to try to get ahead of all the other countries that were likewise making direct uh, deals with manufacturers. The allocation framework, which I'll spend a little bit of time on, was a real key piece, sorry, of, how do you make that? Of, of the design as well, with a real solid emphasis on what do we do in different phases of this circumstance when early on 
the big issue was scarcity of supply. So you, again, demand greater than supply or presumed demand greater than supply. How do you accommodate that? And then, you know, as we have developed over time, quite quickly, actually, demand started to be the limiting factor, not the supply. And, and I think one of the big lessons was it was actually easier. There's time involved, but it was almost easier to accommodate and respond to some of the supply challenges than it was demand. And again, a big lesson being how much investment and anticipation of that is necessary and that work on the ground in countries around setting up and preparing to take up vaccines is critical to to successfully rolling out something like this. Um, as I've mentioned already, when and everybody knows in 2020, there were a number of vaccine R&D programs underway. People didn't know which ones were going to work. And so COVAX alongside, again, many countries were taking bets and really trying to negotiate with manufacturers for some type of advanced agreement um, that should their vaccine be successful, you know, Gavi and COVAX in this case would have access to a certain number of vaccines. And what was the selling point, and again, in an effort to try to get countries to join, because, you know, an early feature and one that gets less coverage actually now, but I think eventually will need to be discussed, is the fact that we intentionally pooled um, what we referred to as AMC countries, so Gavi countries plus. Um, additional ones that were below a certain in income per, per capita, capita threshold, threshold together, together with what we referred to as self-financing um, procurers or purchasers. And so with a real effort to pull that purchasing power, um, there was a decision, and this was a decision, especially for Gavi that doesn't have a lot of experience working with these self-financing purchasers, um, an active effort to bring their requests into ours in an effort again both to address some of the, the bilateral deals that were going on, but also enhance the buying power that COVAX had. So one of the selling points was we're having a portfolio, we're taking a number of bets. Even if two or three or four of these fail, you're guaranteed something because we've placed some kind of bet against this, this number of, of vaccines. Without going into all of the details, as is well known, I think, to everyone, yeah, the miracle, if you will, which isn't as I put those in quotes, because there was a lot of pre-existing investments in R&D, but the fact that we went in less than a year from new vaccine programs being initiated to first regulatory approvals, um, you know, was unprecedented. Um, but, you know, even at that point that vaccines were getting introduced, everyone at that point then had to sort through like, what share of that early supply were you going to get? Um, and then what do you do with it? And in the case of COVAX, there were, you know, a number of products, AstraZeneca being one, um, Serum, which was a supplier of that or a manufacturer of that AstraZeneca vaccine. We had some early deals in place that helped ensure we'd have some vaccine right from the get-go. Um, but we started quickly to bump into situations where we got some early vaccines into country. I think it was within 45 days or something. So, so like first ever, that quick introduction between, I think it was the UK or Israel and um, and one of the low income countries. But then we stalled immediately. And we stalled immediately because India introduced a full ban on exports in order to address its own outbreak situation. And, and we were very dependent on that source of supply coming from India. And then you continue on. And so there's a number of supply shocks that we had to try to accommodate and respond to um, in an effort to try to keep the flow of supply moving. And one of those features and, and tools, and, and Sylvie had it on the slide, although she didn't spend a lot of time on it, is it was the donation. Um, and you know, we were set up as an organization that was trying to procure as many vaccines as possible, pay and pay and get early access. What ended up happening is the majority of those vaccines, no matter what, ended up in high-income countries, but their absorptive capacity or interest or whatever it was did not keep pace with the volumes and volumes of supply that they had advanced, you know, purchased. And come mid-2021, there started to be a shift where countries were making donated vaccines available um, to low-income countries. And so we had this pretty rapid shift from being dependent on purchased vaccines to also having access to donated ones. And with that comes a whole host of challenges as well as opportunities. But you know, this was the kind of work that was going on on the supply side. And I think that 
you know, if you, and I'm not, I'm not going to go into the details on this, but I think what's important is to flag that when we first started, the whole issue was we had very few vaccines and we needed some kind of model of equity to distribute and decide what do we do. So the first early phase of the allocation mechanism was targeted specifically on ensuring everyone got something. Um, and, you know, very quickly and within a year, we were already at a place where demand was the limiting factor. And so we had to switch and evolve the way we took on allocation over time. But I do think, and in retrospect, and even I, I noticed as I was putting, like looking at my slides this morning, there's such a disproportionate focus on the supply side. Um, and of course this whole meeting, but just the general failure, I would say on COVAX's part to do enough preparedness work for the absorptive uh, requirements that some of these vaccines would require. We were just behind on that. Um, you know, very few, I mean, there's some examples, but absorptive capacity being clear, just low demand. Some of the reasons that Sylvie referenced opportunity cost, not a high priority, not a lot of evidence that it was important in certain countries. You know, equity is a good pursuit, except that there is an equal need for vaccines and it's very controversial to be differentiating between countries, especially in the middle of a pandemic. But in the end, all countries didn't need, and, and in, in some ways, countries marched, you know, demonstrated whether they needed it or not by taking vaccines. This other point around wastage, the donated drugs or donated vaccines were often already you know, in packages, in boxes, the shelf life had already been established. And so we had early on needed vaccines from anywhere. Over time, you started ending up with far more donated doses that were at very short, short shelf life and countries' ability to take up short shelf life doses, you know, is just limited. So you ended up with a lot of things in country that ultimately weren't used. Um, there was a lot of effort in 2022 um, into 2023. There was a initiative called COVID, um, COVDP um, that was a delivery platform established with UNICEF, WHO, Gavi, targeting the countries that were having the most trouble taking up vaccines in line with what was perceived as their priority populations and, and needs. Um, but one could argue that that may have come, you know, a little bit late, but there was quite an extensive program put together under COVDP. And the other thing to flag, and this harp comes back to the reference to health systems that in, an investment that the Gavi Alliance already makes is quite a number of countries were able to pivot um, and take up you know, COVID vaccines in the context of some of the existing investments. Just as far as overall gains, the total percent um, was relatively low, but we did have huge impact, I think, again, some of the priority populations so healthcare workers and older adults. And, you know, in the end, you need to look at what was the delay time, but also ultimately which populations eventually got vaccines and I would say we'll end up saying we actually did very well against priority populations, um, maybe not as much around immediate equal availability of vaccine. So I'm just gonna close with a couple uh, learning slides um, and some of these are alluded to and in fact build towards some of the uh, presentation that Sylvie made just about what was missing at the beginning. We didn't have money early, so already Countries were well ahead of us before funding was raised. We didn't have people. I was seconded. I was living in Seattle, um, you know, working in Geneva, um, just as one small example. Um, and, and the relationships, I would say, between the alliance partners was well established, but not for this type of emergency. Gavi is not an emergency responding organization. And, and so even learning how to do that took a lot of time um, and patience, of which we had little of both. Um, and then the country level, again, lots of opportunity for building out uh, the countries to be better positioned to, to respond the next time. In addition to, and again, Sylvie spent quite a lot of time on the left side of this slide, sort of what are some of the learnings from COVAX with an eye towards pandemic prevention, um, preparedness and response. I think Gavi also, you know, we've had a lot of conversation about integrating COVAX back into Gavi and some of the lessons there. Um, a big area that ended up being a, a real sore spot or challenge was reaching humanitarian populations. And, you know, it'd be worth doing a presentation fully on that. But um, I think that's true for Gavi in general. Gavi has 
one of its top priorities is um, reaching the, so zero dose children, reaching everyone who's currently not immunized. And that overlaps very actively with this issue around humanitarian and fragile populations. And so what can we learn from the COVID progress or lack thereof that we could apply back to Gavi? Um, and then I would say relationships between partners, lots have been learned. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to build on that going forward. So with that, I will stop. Thanks.